I would be remiss if I didn't make a video about the unfortunate, the horrific event that took place on Lagba Omer. And there's no way to make it right. There's nothing that we can learn in terms of wisdom, in terms of lessons. There is no way that we can find or we should try to find some reason for the people dying. First of all, it's not up to us to try to discover reasons why somebody else is in pain. When the Talmud talks about looking into yourself, into reasonings for it, we look into ourselves, into our own lives. Why did this happen to me? What did I do to deserve it? And we try to correct it. But for someone else, our job is to comfort. Our job is to assist, to make sure that the people have what they need to continue on. To give honor to the memory of those who passed on in such a horrific way. We have no right to go ahead and criticize, certainly not criticize people who have beautiful Jewish faces and lived exemplary lives. And it's not for us to decide the reasons why they passed on. According to the Rambam, the highest level of devotion is Kiddush Hashem, sanctifying God's name. And these people were there like Baomer singing, An Imam and I believe with perfect belief in the coming of the Messiah. They were participating in a Kiddush Hashem, sanctifying God's name in front of the world with hundreds of thousands of people there. There's no greater Kiddush Hashem than affirming our beliefs in public. So they are on the highest level. And certainly not deserving of punishment, God forbid. This is not a punishment, but an act of cleansing that God has determined we have to have. So I will attempt not to make it right. There's no right that you can make this into. I will attempt to try to extract a little sliver of, of personal improvement that I must address and is important for the rest of the community to address. The number 45 is not just important in Westerns, the Colt 45, the 45 caliber bullet. The number 45 in Torah represents the holy name of God in one of its purest forms. It's called the Shem Ma, Memhe. The number 45 is also the numerical equi equivalent of Adam. What does the human being have to do with God's name? We are created with our characteristics, our souls, our body, paralleling the divine, expressing the divine in everything that we do. The soul is an expression of the divine name. The divine name, Yud and He and Vav and He, the Yud is 
the head, the hay represents the shoulders, the arms, the above is the trunk, and the hay represents, the, the bottom hay represents the pelvic bones and the two legs. Despite the fact that there's a disconnect between the top and the bottom for the hay, nonetheless, in order for the human being to function, it has to be closed. But it is representative of the hay iloa and the hay tatoa, the supernal hay, the lower hay. And the person's soul, the person's very soul, that engarbs itself in the body of the individual also parallels the yud ke vav ke in terms of the quality of the various components of the name. Those same components exist within the soul and they parallel the divine name of God. So number 45, if you looked in the uh, Tikkuni Zohar, the not amended Zohar, but an emendation of the Zohar that that Rav Shimba Yehai added or inserted into the Zohar as an addendum, expressing how you can study something in seventy different ways. Doing so al pi kabola, showing how it's done. Of course, we don't have the ability to parallel that, to teach in 70 different ways. But Rabbi Shimon wanted to show us that the Torah can be studied in 70 different layers, 70 different ways. So the, the Tikkun Yizur that we say, the Tikkun that we say, every Erev Shabbos, is that God's name is the, the life-giving energy that gives life to all things just like water gives life to all plants and all physical animals they must have water to live so to the name yud Vavke, god's ineffable name the tetragrammaton it's called that four-letter name when it is articulated each letter separate, Yud, and then the He, and then the Vav, and then the He, articulated in a certain way, spells out the Shem Ma, the name 45. So 45 represents the holy name of God as each letter is expressed fully together with an aleph, the hay with an aleph, the vav, aleph vav, the hay with an aleph, is equal to, and the yud, yud vav dalad, together equals 45. You can look it up in the Siddur, Erev Shabbos, Tonad ve Leo, um, in that tikkun, it's a tikkun zohar, it expresses the 45, the number 45 for God's name and what its significance is. So the very fact that 45 people fell at the yard site of Rav Shiva Bayechai, they today are with Rav Shim, no question about it. He's taken them into his academy in heaven. But for us, we of flesh and blood see only 45 sacrifices. The 45 represents the essence of godliness that gives life. It gives life to the soul and gives life to the entire cosmos. Why were there 45 people who were trampled to death 45 holy souls. It indicates that we're lacking 
we're missing the 45. We don't have enough of the 45. We're not studying the internal elements of the Torah properly. We're not publicizing it. We're not studying it publicly. And because we lack the insight of the internal elements of the Torah, we become coarse. I've become coarse. Physical, immersed in one's physicality, immersed in one's desires. And we lack the holiness and the spirituality that is represented by the 45. A point to be taken. When I examined the roots of the Holocaust, it was clear that the events that took place, of course, the wicked have to be punished and will be punished if they weren't punished. The people who perpetrated the Holocaust, the Nazis and their leadership, they had a lot of help. Their help was the calcification of the sensitivities of the free world toward the pain of others. They didn't want other people coming to their land. Somehow or other, the land wasn't big enough for so many immigrants, especially immigrants from Southern Europe, Eastern Europe, that spoke with an accent, that weren't Slavic or weren't, I'm sorry, weren't Anglo-Saxons and Germans. And this, this was a bigotry. The bigotry of the Western world was to keep people out to not care for what happened to others, especially the Jewish people. And so the doors of the world were closed, were closed for the Jews trying to escape Nazism. The case in point, the, the St. Louis, that ship with over 930 Jewish people, men, women, and children, sent back by Roosevelt to their deaths. An insensitivity to the plight of others, especially the plight of the Jewish people. And this insensitivity expressed itself more and more during the 20s and the 30s to the point when no nation in the world wanted our refugees they were dumped into no man's land. They suffered horribly and humiliation, persecution, and ultimately death by the Nazis. But the rest of the world was, it was culpable, not equally, but culpable, culpable for their treatment of human beings, their lack of concern. Even after World War I, I'm one of the children born in Germany after World War II. Even after the war, the doors to the Western world remain closed. We, about a quarter of a million of us, saved ourselves from the Nazi Holocaust. Had no bread to eat, had no clothing on our backs, just a little bit clothing. We were given food by the joint distribution and we were held in what we call DP camps, displaced persons camps, where I was born in one of them. And the British refused to allow us to emigrate to Israel, nor did they welcome us into their borders or to Canada or to Australia. The countries of the world refused to accept refugees who were capable of working, of creating wealth for others, because they had the misfortune of being born Jews.
Why am I going at length on this? It is clear that the Holocaust did not take place in a vacuum. There was complicit activity on the behalf of other nations. Not that they did so willfully, consciously, but they did so nonetheless in concert with the anti-Semitism of the, of the Nazis. Case in point, we criticize the Soviet Union for its horrific, horrific uh, human rights history. But if it wasn't for the Soviet Union, those quarter of a million Jews, or even more, they were probably close to a million Jews who saved themselves by escaping Nazism into the Soviet Union. Yeah, old Joe Stalin was a wicked, wily, terrible, despicable person. But at least they allowed us to live. The government of Winston Churchill and Clement Attlee and Franklin Delano Roosevelt did not allow us to live. We were drivel, we were excess baggage for the world. They didn't care that we died. But what happened was Nazism grew out, grew up in an environment that did not allow for Jews to escape. It all came together at one time. The horrific anti-Semitic attitude of the Western world, the so-called humanitarian countries, had no feeling for the lives of others. They said because we're afraid that they'll bring communism there. What drivel communists. There were some people who were running from Hitler had no interest in communism. Had nothing to do with communism, had to do with hatred of the Jew. But this was set up by God so that there was no place to run to. There was no escape. Few people could escape. And they did whatever they could to escape, to get whoever they could to escape, but only a few. The only place for escape of Nazism was to run to the Soviet Union. Yeah, the humanitarian Soviet Union, but at least they let us live. Roosevelt let us die and Joe Stalin let us live. Who is actually the humanitarian here? I don't know. Let me be clear, I hate Stalin, but I have contempt for Roosevelt. There's a lack of resolve, of caring for the lives of many people. A politician, for sure, worried more about his politics in the lives of millions. But this was an attitude, this was the culture that allowed the Holocaust to happen. This was set up. I'm not going to parallel the Holocaust with the events that took place on Lag Boma. The Holocaust is horrific, but it was set up. The scenario was set up by God so that there would be a Holocaust. Clearly, the divine plan had it that way. There was no escape. At Meron, there were two exits. But one of the exits, the police decided was inconvenient and they put a fence there. And the people who got smashed and trampled were most of the people who got smashed at that fence. In other words, 
There was no place to run to, no alternative. People who fell down while others were pushing were going to be trampled to death. This was what was set up. Nobody set it up willfully, but it was caused, obviously, by an unseen hand. So in other words, it's an event, a tragedy that had to happen. And there is no explanation why these people died. But it is clear from the numbers, from the way it was set up, that we have to take a lesson. When people smother each other, they're moving without any kind of self-control. You're pushed by someone else and you're forced to move that way. I've been in such places and thankfully I didn't, have, I didn't fall down, but I was afraid I would fall down and be trampled. Of course, I never was with 90,000 other people. But those of you who have been to 770, been there when people are moving very rapidly, going through a hallway, a narrow pathway, you know what I'm talking about. When you're trying to get into the OHO with several hundred other people in an area that only allows for about 60 people standing up, you know what I'm talking about. The rush of humanity is overwhelming. If somebody would fall, they'd be trampled. That's the reality. The reason for that is we take up space. We take up space. We can't help it. When we're in a body, we take up space. And when we're in a narrow area, a lot of people, the force of movement, especially when it's on a very steep incline, is just overwhelming. People are pushed and they have no control over their motions. Motions, movements. That's the reality. Reality is our bodies got in the way. It was a spiritual place and the body was pushing other bodies and causing other bodies to die. We can't be not a body. Yes, we could lose weight, but it's irrelevant. A thousand people, even a thousand trim people would trample other people who have fallen down. It's not a fact, it's not a question of people losing weight. It appears a question of focus. When a person studies the Kabbalah, the Kabbalah, when you study Kabbalah, you're studying about God, you're studying about how everything is totally totally obliterated relative to God's powers. That there is only the power of God, that the material has no space, no real space. It exists within the divine name of the divine powers and is totally, totally obliterated, non-existent within that. Obviously, we don't have the capacity to cause the physical body to be non-existent. However, the awareness of the presence of God, the pervasive awareness in every facet of our lives to bring God into this, our world, studying the secrets of the Torah and how God's presence exists, not just within the Torah, but within the physical world, within our bodies. Realizing that holiness resides everywhere and pervades everything. And there's nothing outside of God. And everything is one with God. Bringing that knowledge to the outside world has ceased to be a priority. And God was saying, you're forgetting the main focus. You're forgetting the main purpose of Lag Ba'omer. The main purpose of Lag Ba'omer is not Yeshua's and Broches, 
blessings from difficult situations that people should have, uh, get married, and people should give birth to children, people who are sick should be healed. All of that is very important. The main message of Lagba Omer is that there is only one God. Not only is there only one God, there is nothing outside of God. There is only God's power that pervades everything. It's all a veil. We don't see beyond the veil, but we have to learn how to penetrate the veil. We do so by the study of the Kabbalah. And so, my thought about the lesson here says, Adam ki yamus ba'ol. Adam is 45. When 45 die in an ohel, the place where a tzaddik is buried is called an ohel. When there are 45 people who die in the ohel, there has to be a seven day period, seven day period, not just of mourning, 70 period of purification, 70 period of studying the Kabbalah, studying more and more Kabbalahs, becoming aware more and more of the divine presence. And I know I'm lacking that. I know I lack the resolve to do that. But I know that if we did it a little more and a little more and a little more and a little more, it would become fixed in our minds. And maybe that's the message. A painful message. But a message nonetheless that we have to absorb. May all who are mourning be comforted with the coming of Mashiach. All who are in pain or are suffering should be cured and healed from their pains and their suffering. And may the light of Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai pervade the world and shine and shine and shine until it's as bright or brighter than the day. And that will be the time when Mashiach will be manifest. <laughs>